Hello, friends and welcome back to Sorry What. We have a two-part story today and as usual, part two will be uploaded tomorrow. Before we start today's story, please subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet and send some love by liking the video. Now then, let us begin. I just finished packing up the 20 U-Haul. I didn't really like driving large vehicles like this, but it will probably save us hundreds of dollars in moving costs. Mia was going to follow me in her car with the kids. We should be in the city by mid-afternoon. I was looking forward to this change. Though I liked living in Stanhope I knew Mia couldn't wait to get back to the city. It's where she grew up and went to school. I'd met most of her friends and they were all mostly okay. Mostly. There were a few stories that I think she censored for me. I knew she had a bit of a wild past. But, I rationalize, her experiences made her the person I married, and my experiences did the same for her. I had grown over time to love her, I knew that, but every so often I questioned some of my decisions. Because of some of this, and one particular incident, we nearly didn't get married. The circumstances around our marriage were not ideal. But let's start from the beginning. I think it will be better understood with the backstory. I graduated from Stanhope State with a business degree. The summer after my junior year I interned at Northern Forest Products as a broker's assistant. NFP sold lumber all over the world. The main office was in the college town of Stanhope. I enjoyed learning about lumber, building materials, and the different customers that bought products from us. It was a fast-paced grind. Beyond the products and the customers I learned a couple of important things about the business. 1. It was a high-pressure job with goals, deadlines, and pressure to perform. The other thing I learned, the guys that were good at it made a lot of money. After I graduated I started as a sales trainee at NFP. I worked for an experienced broker named Larry Belinsky. Larry was a large, somewhat sloppy guy, who knew the lumber business. For the first six weeks Larry and I worked side by side in the office, and I learned a lot. After those several weeks Larry rarely came into the office. I quickly gathered that you didn't really need to be physically in the office to do business. Most of the time it was just talking to people literally all over the world selling lumber. As the months passed I was doing more and more of Larry's work. I never knew exactly how much he was making on commissions, but I heard enough to know it was a lot. Meanwhile I was on a trainee straight salary. The key, I soon learned in this business, was to tell the truth and get people to trust you. Later, I speculated, that same lesson encompassed more than just business. Relationships too. We'll get to all that soon enough. Shortly after my first full year Larry seemed to be less and less at the office. He was beginning to have health issues, I gathered. He had been divorced from his third wife for a little over a year. Despite his income he lived in a manufactured home in a park on the east side of Stanhope. He may be a good lumber salesman, but his personal life was a mess. There was a bar between the office and Larry's place in East Stanhope called the Timbers. It was not unusual to see his aging Chevy Tahoe, parked not quite squarely, in the Timbers parking lot at any hour of the day. On a Monday nearly two years into my employment at NFP, I arrived to a subdued atmosphere in the office. Fairly quickly the information trickled out. Larry had a stroke and was now in a rehabilitation facility. No one knew what the long-term prognosis would be, but he wasn't expected to make it back to work. In the meantime, we had business to conduct. After lunch that Monday I was called into the sales manager's office. We spoke briefly about Larry and then quickly the talk turned to business and the go-forward plan. We're not going to turn 100% of his book over to you, he told me, but you've done a good job Patrick, you'll get a lot of that. I was happy that they thought I was doing well enough to take over at least part of Larry's book of business. In fact since I'd been working with Larry our business had grown. It wasn't until a few weeks later that I realized the financial impact of my new status. My first monthly commission check was for just over $14,000. And it wasn't even for the whole month. That Friday when I got home I did some quick calculations. Even in a worst case scenario, I calculated that I was going to be pulling in a good, low, six-figure income. I was excited, upbeat. I also did have some remorse for Larry, but the reality was, I didn't really know him all that well. I needed to do something to celebrate. I called my buddy Tim Pierce. Tim was still in school getting his masters. Price, what's happening? He answered. He always called me by my last name. I explained that I wanted to take him out for dinner and a few drinks to celebrate. Celebrate what? He asked. I told him I'd explain later. We decided to meet at Poncho's, an upscale Latin restaurant with a great bar. One of those places you could never afford in college but always wanted to go to. Friday night it was packed. A combination of professionals and newly graduated college students in their first jobs. I explained to Tim about my new lucrative business situation at NFP. I didn't tell him exact numbers, but hinted at what I expected to make. 
Price, he began, you know I'm getting my MBA in finance. I interned with a financial services company last year, and I have an offer to start in June. We should set up a financial plan for you. And we began talking about my plan. As we talked the restaurant became busier. We were standing at a tall bistro table with stools designed for four people. A large group began encroaching on our space. As Tim and I were discussing stock index funds I felt someone tap me on the shoulder. I turned and there was a tall, striking, dark-haired woman, girl really, smiling and looking at me. Are you using this stool? She asked me, still smiling. Normally I'm not a super outgoing person, I wasn't introverted, just even keeled. Tonight though, buoyed by my financial success, I was in an upbeat mood. We are, I said, before you, I would be more than glad to let you have it. I said, smiling back at her. She thanked me and nudged it maybe six inches away, still quite close to Tim, and I Tim chatted briefly with a thin blonde girl across the table from the one I'd spoken to. The tall girl gave me another smile as she mounted the stool and turned back toward her friends. A few minutes later I asked the girl next to me if we could buy them a drink. They agreed and the four of us began chatting. The evening went on with more drinks and more talk. I learned the dark-haired girl was named Mia Durant. She had graduated from Stanhope State and had a marketing degree, and was working for a local advertising company in Stanhope. The more I was with her the more I found her attractive. Dark hair, beautiful eyes and a great smile. We left Poncho's and walked to a smaller local bar called Pinocchio's. It was a little quieter and we had some more d'oeuvre and more drinks. The night got a little fuzzy with all the drinks, and at one point I realized that Tim and the blonde were gone. Well, Mia began, it's kind of getting late. I'm just a few blocks from here she told me. I gallantly told her I would walk her home. We got to her door and she turned to put in the code to open the door. She unlocked it, turned back around, and we were only inches apart. She looked at me and then we kissed. A full-blown passionate kiss with mouths locked and hands caressing. We stumbled into the condo. The combination of alcohol and sex hit us both. After individual trips to the bathroom we both passed out on the bed. I woke in the middle of the night needing to use the bathroom once again. When I woke out I nearly bumped into her roommate, the blonde that had been with Tim. Oops. She called out as I surprised her. She glanced down at my naked body, specifically my clock. She smiled as she shut the bathroom door. I repassed out pressed into the warmth of Mia's body. It must have been several hours later when I felt her move. I looked up to see her sitting nude on the edge of the bed and turned away from me. I reached up and rubbed her back. After a moment she replied. Good morning, she said, still facing away from me. I need a shower, she declared. Yes, you do, I said, I think I'm going to need to help you get cleaned up. She turned and looked at me with a small smile, and then her eyes trailed down to my resurrected clock. She grabbed at me smiling and said, let's go. When we emerged after our long shower, the blonde girl was sitting at the small kitchen table. Good morning, she smiled and called to us as we emerged. Only one bathroom here. What was your name again? She asked as I scrambled back into Mia's room. Patrick Price, I told her as my towel nearly slipped off. We both dressed chatting about the evening and occasionally smiling at each other. We emerged and sat down at the breakfast table and drank coffee. Eventually I knew I needed to go, but I was enjoying their company. I learned that the blonde was named Lisa Shea, and she was Mia's good friend. I also learned that Tim and she spent some time together. He didn't stay all night. She said, I'm engaged, she explained. As if that made logical sense. I'll have to get the story from Tim, I thought. Well I guess I better go find my truck, I told the girls. Mia walked me to the door and gave me a nice kiss goodbye. I had a real good time with you Patrick, text me. She said. I walked away happy and satisfied. I met an attractive good looking girl with probably the best melons I'd ever touched. I was still buoyed by my income realization. I was in a good mood. I thought about Mia for a couple of days before I contacted her. As I said, she's great looking, she was fun to be with, and she was good in bed. But, I thought, I wasn't much of a casual dater. If I was going to put energy into a relationship I wanted to know that there was a long-term possibility. I called her midweek. Hey, she answered brightly, how are you Patrick? I could tell she was happy to hear from me. I'm glad you called, she continued, I was hoping it wasn't another one night stand. Another. I thought. For the moment I pushed those thoughts to the side. We made plans to get together this coming weekend. Over the next few weeks we started dating, seeing each other mostly on the weekends, normally staying at my condo, or occasionally hers. The typical date was dinner, a few drinks and then back to my place for some fantastic sex. Sometimes we'd run into friends, mostly Mia's. 
I'd seen Lisa, Mia's roommate, a few times and made it a point to follow up with my friend Tim and see what went on that first night. I called him on the way home from work one day. Price, how are you doing? Tim answered good-naturedly. Still making the big bucks. Now that I'm full-time investment counselors we really need to put a plan together for you. I agreed and we made small talk for a few minutes. Finally I brought up the night we met Mia and Lisa. I asked him what happened blaming alcohol for my lack of recollection. Oh, man. Tim begins. So, after we went to that second bar she half dragged me back to her apartment. You look like you were doing just fine with the dark haired girl. I agreed. Anyway, we get there and she's stripping before we're even in the front door. We jump in the sack and she's wild. Fun, but almost too much. After we duck, Tim continues, she tells me I need to go. Her boyfriend, her fiancé, wasn't sure what the deal was, sometimes came over late, and that he had a bad temper. This was definitely getting interesting. I'd not been introduced to the fiancé, but I knew who he was, Mitch, something. I think I dressed and left in about 60 seconds. I was going to go find you, but I just got an Uber. Crazy night. How'd you do? He asked. One other weird thing she said to me. I'd kind of forgotten about it. What? I asked him. As I was leaving she told me, and stay clear of Mia, last time Mitch spent the night, she nearly ducked him it was all kind of a blur. Then I heard her laughing so I guessed it must be some kind of inside joke. Tim finished. This gave me a moment to pause. Did that really happen between me and Lisa's boyfriend? It didn't seem likely, it was probably just a joke, like Tim had thought. I told him I had a good time but left out any details. Quickly he changed the subject. Hey, the Stanhope Stars home football game is in a few weeks, the company has tickets. Wanna go? I definitely did and we made arrangements for the Saturday night game. I love September football games. The weather is normally good, unlike the rainy cold November games. Mia and I continued to see each other and so far everything was great. I have to say that at the back of my mind I was a little concerned about Mia. She'd done nothing specific that I knew of, but from a few things she mentioned about her lifestyle, she seemed a bit wilder than I was used to. The coming weekend was Labor Day. I asked her if she wanted to go camping with me. I told her how I love to be outdoors, hiking, fishing, and occasionally rock climbing. You mean, she asked hesitantly, sleep in a tent. I assured her she would enjoy it, I had all the equipment, and I promised she would have a good time. She agreed with noticeably less enthusiasm than normal. That weekend the weather was perfect. We camped in a state park with more modern restroom facilities, not porta potties. We cooked on the camp stove and made a campfire at night in the fire pit. About halfway through Saturday she began to shed her reservations and started to really enjoy the outdoors. That night around the fire she asked me what we were going to do tomorrow. Have you ever been fishing? I asked. She hadn't and I told her about this secret fishing spot I knew about. We need to hike a few miles to get there, but it's worth it. I told her and she sounded willing to try. The next day we were up early. We had our backpacks, fishing gear, water and light snacks for the journey. I have fished this creek before. You had to cross the stream at a particular point to get to the fishing hole. I'd never seen anyone else in this part of the stream when I fished at this spot before. We set up and I got Mia's rod and reel baited and showed her how it worked. There was a big flat rock over a clear pool where I told her to try. I said I'd walk the creek a little bit, but that pool would be a good place for her. Over the next hour or so I caught a few fish. When a nice size rainbow trout. I had to explain to Mia about catch and release. I was a bit upstream from her spot when I heard Mia shout excitedly. I caught one, I caught one. She yelled. She had caught a mid-sized trout. I took her picture with the fish. She was very excited. Okay, she began, I'm retiring. I'm going to lay on my towel on this big flat rock and get some sun. I laughed and said I was going to fish a little more, upstream. Afterwards, walking back not only the physical intimacy of our sex, but the experience together, camping, fishing and her acceptance of these new activities, strengthened my feelings. That night around the campfire, Mia leaned her head on my shoulder with her arm around me, and she whispered into my ear. You know Patrick, she began, I'm beginning to really like you. I smiled with that same strong feeling about her too. I thought we had just rounded a corner in our relationship. It was a good weekend. Normally during the week we get together at least once. This week we decided to have dinner Wednesday night. As we sipped wine we began to talk about the coming weekend. She mentioned a party Saturday night. It's at a friend of Mitch's. She told me. Mitch Markham was her roommate Lisa Shea's fiancé. I'd met him a couple of times, and he seemed okay for a guy with a big ego. Kind of a frat boy. I also knew his friend, the guy having the party. 
I'm not sure I can make it, I told Mia, the football game is Saturday, they normally go pretty late. Oh, that's right. She said, I really wanted to go to the party with you. I told her I'd try and then we began talking about other things. That Saturday Tim and I went to the game. The stars were playing a ranked team and the stadium was sold out. We had a couple of beers before the game and then one at halftime. Surprisingly the game was still close going into the fourth quarter. The other team was up by three and driving for the clinching touchdown with less than a minute to play. The quarterback threw a sideline pass that was tipped by our defensive lineman. The crisp pass was slowed by the tip, and our safety plucked it out of midair and returned it for a Stars touchdown. The Stars had upset their opponent. The entire stadium, except a few opposing fans, went crazy. Tim and I hung around for a bit amidst the celebration. We eventually began to slowly leave the stadium in an upbeat mood. Even though it was late, nearly 11.30 we were energized by the football game. Hey, I said to Tim, do you want to stop by that party? He agreed. I began thinking about me. Is she gone maybe she and I could hook up and end up back at my place. My excitement increased. By the time we got to the apartment the party was still going strong. Tim and I went to the keg and sipped a beer as we talked to various acquaintances. I was also scanning the crowd for me. So far I hadn't seen her. Tim got pulled off somewhere with a girl he knew and I just hovered around the keg chatting. I had my back to two guys, still students I gathered by their conversation. I heard them looking at girls, making comments. It was amusing to eavesdrop on these two. Look at that, one of them said, she looks like she just got ducked. The comment drew my attention, I turned and saw them glancing upward toward the stairs. I saw a girl and some guy walking down the stairs, her arm around him, leaning into him. She had a bit of a disheveled look. Hair must, makeup slightly smeared. But there was no doubt who it was and what she'd been up to. The guys behind me had described her accurately. She did look freshly ducked, and as you may have guessed I certainly recognized her. It was Mia. I froze for a moment. My first instinct was to confront her, but then I hesitated. I didn't want some big dramatic encounter at this party. I'd seen that type of scenario before. It was messy and embarrassing. I decided to leave. I sent him a quick text. At these types of parties it was every man for himself. He texted me back with a thumbs up. As I walked the short distance to my apartment I thought long and hard. Mia and I had not made any stated formality to our relationship. We had not yet pledged exclusivity to one another. I guess I couldn't blame her. But I also didn't think I wanted to have a relationship with a woman that would screw me one weekend and then someone else the next. I rationalized that I shouldn't be mad at her, but I also thought about what I wanted. I wanted something more than a weekly booty call. It was obvious that our objectives were different. By the time I arrived at my place I'd reached a resolution. No angry scenes, just an immediate severance of our relationship. I have to admit I'd really begun to care for her. It saddened me and I knew I would miss her. But as I decided, what I want and what apparently she wants were two different things. The following day, Sunday, I just went about my regular weekend chores. Wash my truck, do some laundry, go for a run. What I didn't do was contact me. Mid-afternoon I received a text. How was the game? I didn't reply. That evening there was another one, what are you up to? Want to grab dinner? Once again I didn't reply. I went to bed, still saddened but resolute. Monday at work she called my cell phone. I let it go to voicemail. Monday evening after work and a pre-dinner run I was home at my apartment, Monday night football was on. I heard knocking on my door. I guess who it likely was, and for a moment I considered just not answering. But then I thought, this meeting was going to happen sometime. May as well get it over with. I told myself don't get angry, stay calm. I opened the door. Hey you. She said as I opened the door. Where have you been? She asked, a big happy smile on her face. She moved to hug me hello. My response was not what she expected. I wittingly patted the small of her back. No enthusiasm. She paused and looked at me with a confused look on her face. I'd always been affectionate with her. She could tell something was different. How are you doing? She asked, studying my face still perplexed by my attitude change. I told her I was doing fine, offering no details. Why haven't you called me? She asked, didn't you get my messages? I told her I haven't had a chance. It was obvious she wasn't buying this. Are you mad about something? She asked. I took a deep breath and sat down on a kitchen chair. Look Mia, I began, I think you and I want different things out of this, I pause, relationship. We've had some fun and it's been good to get to know you, but I think we are two different people. 
She studied my face, her smile now gone, her brows wrinkled trying to understand what was happening. Are you dumping me? She asked. After all the things we've done together. Camping and fishing. That was just a week ago we had a great time. What happened? I thought things were going fine. I could tell she was starting to get emotional. She just stared at me, not comprehending. Finally I began. I told her I wasn't into casual dating. I wanted there to be a potential for a long-term situation down the line. I told her I knew we had made no spoken commitments to one another, but for me, I wasn't interested in playing the field. I agree Patrick, she said to me. I want all that too. I sat looking at her with the slightest smile on my face. My head shook from side to side. What? She asked. I paused and then began talking about Saturday night. Tim and I went to the football game Saturday night, she was nodding her head, we had a good time. The team won and everyone was in a good mood. I went on, we decided to go over to the party. You were there. She interrupted, a mixed look on her face. I told her how we arrived and that I hoped I'd see her. I then told her I was standing by the keg and overheard the two guys talking about the freshly ducked looking girl walking down the stairs with some tall guy. I then stopped and just looked at her. The ball was now firmly in her court. She was quiet for a minute digesting what I had said. Putting things together. The party and then the lack of callbacks. Patrick, that was nothing, that was just Blake, the guy I went to St. Thomas with. I hadn't seen him in a long time. He's just a friend. She pleaded. I sat there staring at her. I was positive about what I saw. And then I asked her the key question. Did you have sex with him? I calmly asked. She sputtered. Sex. What makes you think we had sex? He's just an old friend from high school that I was catching up with. I stood up. Gently but firmly I walked her to the door, my hand at the small of her back. She continued to protest. Finally, outside, on my front porch I told her I would think about things. I kissed her softly on the cheek, turned, entered my apartment and closed the door. I never looked back out as she slowly walked to her car, tears in her eyes. The next year and a half was a mixture of things for me. I was really doing well at work. I'd taken the book of business they'd given me and nearly doubled it. In truth it wasn't that hard. As near as I could tell Larry was barely working half time. It wasn't hard to improve on that. The other good thing was that my friend, Tim Pierce, was doing a good job managing my money. I was pleased to see my investments growing at a double digit rate. I considered buying a house, I certainly could afford a substantial down payment. But to be honest I was lonely. I wanted a woman in my life. I was concerned if I bought a house and lived there alone it may make things seem more lonely. I dated several women over the past year or so. Nothing really lasted too long. The longest was a woman named Hillary. Very nice, attractive in a bit of a plain way, but intelligent. She worked at a mid-sized accounting firm. We began hanging out and eventually had sex. It must have been about two months later I realized something about us together wasn't working. This sounds terrible, but she kind of bored me. I will admit there was not a thing wrong with Hillary. Attractive, professional, intelligent, but I found myself uninterested. I had an idea why but for a few weeks I suppressed it. Finally one night, face to face, I broke up with her. She was more surprised than saddened. She wanted to know why, and I wasn't able to give her any kind of satisfying answer. She ended up angered at me. We can still be friends, I told her as she stood to leave, her meal half finished. She never replied to my offer of friendship as she turned and left the restaurant. Later alone with my thoughts my suppressed reasons for my dissatisfaction with Hillary emerged. I was comparing her to Mia. Mia was fun to be with. She was up to try different things, sexy and attractive. And in bed the comparisons became even more one-sided. On the other hand I was pretty sure that Hillary would never cheat on me. These were the confused thoughts I pondered. Had Mia wrecked me? Would no other woman ever compare? I had not seen Mia since the confrontation at my apartment over a year ago. I had heard through friends of friends she was still in Stanhope. News of her always got my attention, but I tamped down the occasional thought of contacting her. But as fate would have it our paths crossed. Tim and I were downtown for a charity event at the Roosevelt Hotel. There was a dinner, an auction, and a band for dancing. I sat at a table with several couples all from the investment company where Tim worked. After the dinner the band started playing, we were hanging out chatting and enjoying the evening. All of a sudden I got an elbow in the ribs from Tim. Incoming, 11 o'clock, he whispered to me. Impossible to ignore, I turned and there was Mia. She was smiling and walking directly toward me. If anything, she looked better than I remembered. I turned and smiled at her and extended a hand to shake. She ignored my hand and gave me a nice full-bodied hug. 
Hello stranger, she said to me in greeting. For a slightly awkward moment we stood there without speaking, just looking at each other. And then quickly Mia began talking, asking how I was doing, and what was new in my life, etc. Fairly soon we were seated at another table chatting and catching up. It was like we just started up at the point we'd last been at. It just all felt so familiar and natural. Unspoken was any reference to what had transpired at the party. We danced a few times and basically spent the last several hours of the evening together. In fact we were deep in conversation sitting at a table, the band long packed up and gone, when all of a sudden the ballroom lights began to dim. It was time to go, but it was like neither of us wanted the evening to end. Finally we stood up. Mia gave me another hug, a kiss mostly on the cheek, turned and headed toward the exit. Partway there she stopped and turned back. Call me, she said. And I nodded. I had a mental tug of war going on over the next few days. On one hand, I'd had such a great time with Mia at the auction. Definitely the best night I had experienced in many months. On the other hand, I didn't trust her. Did I want to open myself up to a relationship that I didn't have faith in? This was my struggle. Finally two days later I gave in and called her. I promised myself to have fun, enjoy hanging out with her, but be cautious. We began seeing each other all over again. It felt familiar and comfortable. Mia had also seemed like she changed. Less wild, more stable. More mature. One area where she was not less wild was sexually. I found that out after the third time we'd been together. She was just as fun as I remembered. Unfairly I compared her to Hillary. No contest. We were out to dinner one night about a month or so after we had begun seeing one another again. All of a sudden Mia got a serious look on her face. Patrick, she began, I think we need to talk about something. Not sure where this was going, I just nodded. I need to explain about Blake. Blake. For a moment I didn't know what she was talking about. And then all of a sudden I remembered. Blake, from the party. That Blake. This will be interesting, I thought. She told me a story. She had gone to a Catholic high school in the city. A lot of kids went there to get a supposed better education. Mia had gone because her grandmother was a strong Catholic. Mia had been raised Catholic. In high school she had been a little overweight. There was a group of kids that were kind of the in crowd. The most popular kids at St. Thomas. It was Blake Langley, Taylor White, and Lisa Shea, Mia's roommate. Mia always felt slightly out of the inner circle. But there was no doubt, Blake was the king. His family was wealthy, owning car dealerships in the city. Blake always drove a new car. He was a tall good looking guy, confident and fun to be around. While most of the other kids were experimenting with new experiences, like sex, Mia was abiding by her Catholic upbringing. Drummed into her head was that sex was saved for marriage. I recalled her whispered words when we made love for the first time, fumbling with the condom. Mia went on to say when she got to Stanhope as a freshman, she felt the oppressive weight of her upbringing lift. I have to admit, she told me, I kind of went a little wild in college. I gathered this and hearing these words I couldn't suppress some pangs of jealousy. I kept quiet. Another thing happened when I got to college, she told me, I started working out. I took a fitness class as an elective, I was hooked. I became compulsive about it. I went from 165 pounds to 135. Most kids put on weight in college. I lost it. She then said she started getting even more attention from the guys. Not only was she sexually active, she looked better. I could attest to that. She had a great body. She then began talking about the party. She was happy having a good time and was surprised to run into Blake. She had only seen him a few times since high school. He suddenly was paying a lot of attention to her. She recalled in high school always hoping to get attention from Blake. And now it was happening. It was like I was suddenly in a different time in my life. Back to high school where popularity was so important. And here I was with the most popular guy around. And, I didn't have the sexual hang up that I had in high school. One thing led to another, and she trailed off. And then when I figured out I lost you over some quick roll in the hay with a guy I'd barely talked to in years. She paused, it broke my heart. I can't tell you how many times I wanted to call you. But, you were so called to me that day. I was afraid. And you want to know the funny thing, she added, I found out a few weeks later that Blake is engaged to some girl he met in college back east. I really felt cheap. So that's the story. She told me. I learned a lesson and I've changed since then. I just nodded, absorbing the information. It was a plausible explanation. But my approach was still going to be slow and steady with Mia. We continued to see one another, usually all weekend, and once or twice during the week. I was definitely getting a more mature version of Mia that I appreciated, while still getting the sexually wild Mia behind closed doors. 
We've been together for nearly three months since we reconnected and all was good. More and more I repressed the thoughts of Mia and Blake screaming at the party. I was still taking it slow, but there was no doubt we were a solid couple. We did have a discussion about exclusivity, and we both agreed on it. The word love was occasionally whispered during passionate moments. And then everything changed. It was a Tuesday night. Nothing special, we had not planned on getting together that night. Surprisingly I heard a knock on my door. It was Mia. She had a strange look on her face. Not quite desperate but something like that. I'd never seen this look on her before, something serious was up. What's wrong? I asked her. And then she told me. I remembered the night. We had a little too much wine. The sex that night had been extra vigorous. There had been a slight accident with the condom. You can guess the rest. I'm not going to trap you. She told me, but I am having my baby. We both sat there. Suddenly important life decisions had to be made. I thought about what I wanted and what she wanted and what may happen. We talked for a long time that night with no clear decision being made. I did notice something of a further change in me. I saw a new maturity. A slight shift from the fun-loving girl I'd first met. To be honest I think I like the new version better. Later, alone, as I analyzed these new developments in my life, I realized something. The only thing holding me back was thoughts of Mia's past. She was definitely wild during her college years. She told me that. And of course ducking Blake Langley that night. She'd explained that. Sort of. It still bugged me. I thought I could compartmentalize that. But the memory was never fully extinguished. I gave it lots of thought, and ultimately, I decided we should stay together for many reasons including the welfare of the baby. My child-to-be. The next few months were a whirlwind. We moved in together, and then moved to a three-bedroom townhouse. Mia planned a wedding. Her mom helped. She'd be six months pregnant at the wedding. So she'd show. The entire time leading up to the wedding and ultimately the birth was a crazy, exciting, nerve-wracking time. The entire course of my life took a completely different turn and bottom line, I was happy about it. One note. The wedding was small, no time to plan for an extravagant affair. Mostly her family, my small family and friends. Friends from both our sides. What I didn't realize until it was too late, was that it included Blake Langley. When I heard that I protested. Mia, I'm not having that guy at the wedding. I told her. This led to a big argument. Eventually her logic won out. Langley, Taylor White, Lisa Shea, now Lisa Markham, she married Mitch Markham, were all friends from high school. These are all my high school friends. I can't invite everyone else and leave Blake out. She took a breath and continued. Besides, he'll be with his wife Bree. I didn't know he was married. I reluctantly agreed. We pulled the wedding off and all was fine. I actually met Blake Langley. He was on his best behavior, I had to admit I liked the guy. Didn't trust him, but liked him. And his wife Bree, was model hot. Tall, taller than Mia, long blonde hair, and an extremely shapely body. As if in a whirlwind, with the wedding over, suddenly we were parents. Mia had a boy we named Michael. Life changed for us. Everything had to be planned. Spontaneity was a thing of the past. But it was good. I love being a father. And Mia surprised me at what a good mother she became. I had spoken about how I had seen Mia mature over the years. No longer the crazy college chick, now a beautiful mature mother, who I found even more attractive than her younger version. A few things changed with us as new parents. Mia quitting her job at the advertising firm was one of the changes. She was a full-time mom. She still found time to work out, and soon her post-pregnancy body was as firm and taut as it had ever been. About a year after Michael was born I came home to a candlelight dinner. Mia informed me that Michael was down for the night. I began to wonder what the occasion was. I have a surprise for you. She announced with a smile on her face. The surprise was that Mia was pregnant again. We had discussed it, and both of us agreed we wanted another child. I just didn't know it was going to happen this quickly. I guess we better start looking for a house, I announced. We had talked about it, but we'd been too busy to do anything. The townhouse we were renting had three bedrooms, so we were not cramped for space. Still we wanted our own home and decided to start looking once the new baby was born. A few months later we got more news. Mia was pregnant with twins. All of a sudden the discussion between having two or three children had been solved for us. The size of our future home now would need to accommodate five. Mia gave birth to twin girls. We named them Cleo and Claire. I know, a little cute to see, but that's what we wanted, and that is who our two precious girls became. We found a big rambling two-story house a little out of town and bought it. It would be hard to call it our dream house, but it worked for our immediate needs. For the next couple of years our life was good. 
stressful with the three children but also quite rewarding full of happiness and domesticity. My job was going well. I began to broker some more untraditional building materials, and even when the normal markets were slow, I had alternative products to sell. Financially we were doing fine. We found a woman who would come in three days a week for a few hours, and this allowed Mia to run errands, grocery shop, and go to the gym. The kids loved Estrelita and she became a part of our household. Guess what, Mia asked one evening after I got off work. My 10-year high school reunion is this coming summer. She told me, waving around the invitation. She went on to say that she really wanted to go. We could stay with her mom and her grandma in the city. We would bring the kids and make a mini vacation out of the event. Her mom and grandma would get to spend time with the kids while we went to the various reunion functions. I agreed, but deep inside I was far less excited about the reunion. I'd met some of her friends and they were all quite nice, but I figured Blake Langley would be there. Not only did the fact that he ducked my wife, well girlfriend then, those years ago, bother me, but from what Elle knew the guy had an oversized ego. As it turned out, there was an event scheduled for the reunion. A casual get-together at a neighborhood bar on Friday night. Saturday was the formal reunion at the Davenport Hotel downtown, and then if that wasn't enough there was a family picnic on Sunday at Laurelwood Park. Soon enough we drove the two hours to Mia's mom's house in the city where we would stay over the weekend. The next day was the gathering at Marshfield's pub. Immediately after we got there Mia rushed over to a cluster of girls, including Lisa and a few others I recognize. These were her good friends from high school. I drifted to the outside perimeter of the crowd. I saw Langley, with Taylor White, Mitch Markham and some other guys. Even at the reunion the high school cliques were reforming. I sipped a beer and calmly watched the social interactions. From across the room I could hear Langley talking. He was one of those guys who naturally talked loudly. I wasn't even near him, and I heard most of what he was saying. I did notice him and his crowd glancing toward the girls and lowering their voices. I thought I heard them even mention Mia's name. I watched as they looked over at Mia and the girls. Langley whispered something to the group, and then they all burst out in laughter. I could pretty well imagine the nature of his comments. I turned my attention away from the guys, and suddenly I recognized someone I knew. It was Teresa Pierce, my friend Tim's sister. I walked toward her. Teresa, hi, I began introducing myself, Patrick Price. Your brother Tim's friend. I said. She looked at me for a moment, and then smiled. Patrick, of course. I remember you, she said. I was happy to see a familiar face at this event. Patrick Teresa began, this is my husband Ryan O'Malley. We shook hands and smiled. Ryan was slim, wore glasses, conservatively dressed, and was pleasant looking. Not the frat boy look of Langley and that bunch. I learned that Ryan had gone to St. Thomas, and that he and Teresa now lived in the city in the Garlington neighborhood. I told them that I was married to Mia. Mia Durant. Ryan told me he knew her in school. But I got the feeling he didn't hang out with the same group of people. Like a social lifeline I clung to Teresa and Ryan pleasantly comparing college and post-college experiences. I learned that Ryan was a civil engineer, and Teresa taught high school health. Eventually they left and I turned to check in with Mia and see how long we had to stay. I saw that a cluster of friends had merged with Langley and the guys. I felt a pang of jealousy noticing Mia standing by Langley. I walked over, nudged in between Langley and Mia and asked her how she was doing. I surprised her, but then she kissed me on the cheek. She reintroduced me to some of her friends, and everyone seemed pleasant. Langley acted extra nice asking me about my kids, my job, and other superficial topics. I have to admit he was charming. But there was something about him I just didn't trust. Later as we drove home Mia talked about how much she missed her friends from high school. I told her about running into Teresa and her husband. I asked Mia where Brie was, Langley's beautiful wife. They're not together anymore, was all she said. The following evening was the more formal of the series of reunion events. Mia wore a low-cut dress that showed some cleavage. She looked very good. I declared on the ride to the hotel that I'd be the designated driver. At the event I sipped a light beer and Mia and all her friends had cocktails. I noticed Langley, White, Markham and the same gang of guys as last night all together drinking and laughing. I wandered over to that group. We chatted and I gathered a little more information about them. Langley's family owned the local Toyota dealership in the city, and he was the general manager. It turned out that Mitch Markham was the sales manager there and worked for Langley. Taylor White was a lawyer, and Langley Motors was one of his clients. Langley and White lived in Garlington Heights near where Teresa and Ryan O'Malley lived. Eventually I walked away after a surprisingly decent conversation with these guys. They all seemed like people that I would be friends with under different circumstances. Still, and I couldn't exactly determine why, I did not trust Blake Langley. 
most probably because I knew he ducked my wife those years ago. Try as I might I couldn't ever quite get that out of my head. Later there was dancing. Mia and I danced several songs, I could tell she was on the edge of drinking too much. She danced with a couple of the guys including Langley. Without being obvious I kept my eye on them while they danced. I saw no inappropriate actions. Later, driving home, I reflected that maybe my wariness for Mia's guy friends from high school was not warranted. For the most part they seemed like decent people, and any negative feelings for them were misplaced. Yeah, Langley had an ego and bragged a bit. But was that so bad? The following day was the picnic at the park. The weather was nice. I estimated about half the attendees had little kids, like us. Michael had just turned three and the twins, Claire and Cleo, were 14 months old and trying to master the art of walking. There were a lot of activities going on. A couple of the guys were throwing a football, and someone was trying to organize a volleyball game. With three little kids my activities were focused on them. Mia and I were trying to get the kids fed peanut butter and jelly sandwiches when Langley and Lisa walked over. Pat, we need a body for volleyball, are you in? Langley asked. I love volleyball. I had played in a city league in Stanhope before Michael was born. Thanks man, I said to him, I've got my hands full. Motioning to my kids. Lisa chimed in and told me that she'd help Mia with the kids and for me to go play. I hesitated for just a moment and then joined the game. I saw they had recruited Ryan O'Malley and a few more people. About half the players knew how to play and the other half knew about as much as you picked up in gym class. At first it was fun, but fairly quickly the guys on the other side, including Langley and Markham got competitive. Both those guys were over 6 foot and athletic. They started spiking. Clearly my team was losing, if any score was actually being kept. At one point I saw someone set up Langley for another spike. As I said, I actually had played a fair amount of competitive volleyball. Just as he went to spike I jumped straight up close to my side of the net, with my arms extended flat and vertical. I blocked the spike straight back, and it ricocheted sharply off the side of Langley's head. My team cheered to play, and for a moment I saw an angry look flash across Langley's face. Just as quickly it was gone and a smile appeared on his face. Nice bluff hat, he called to me. After that the level of play from the other side increased. More spikes and mild trash talking continued. This was no longer a friendly carefree game. It had gotten serious. On one particular play Langley spiked it directly at Ryan O'Malley's face. It looked deliberate. Ryan's glasses flew off and I could see him put his hand to his face. It looked like it may have hurt. I picked up his glasses and told the group I was done. They all urged me to continue, but I ignored them as Ryan and I walked back to where Teresa was sitting. Ryan never made a negative comment or complained about the shot to his face, but it must have hurt. At first with the kids all buckled up in the car Mia was in a good mood, happy talking about her friends as we drove away from the city and home to Stanhope. About halfway home, she became quiet withdrawn. Hey, what's up? I asked, you doing okay? She didn't answer me at first, quietly staring out the window. By now I knew the correct strategy. Stay silent and wait for her to answer. Finally she replied. I miss my friends. She said, I also miss my mom and my grandma. She added. She went on to talk about how much her mom and grandma loved spending time with the kids, and what a help that was to her. I always imagined my children growing up around my family and friends, she told me. Stan hopes okay, but I miss the city. I thought for a few minutes. I really didn't need to be geographically near my office. Our periodic sales meetings I could easily drive to. Even Tim Paris had left Stanhope and was living in a suburb outside the city. There really wasn't much keeping us in Stanhope. I began to consider the possibility of moving. Our house in Stanhope sold quickly and we made a substantial profit. We ended up buying a house in the nice Garlington neighborhood, around the corner from Teresa and Ryan O'Malley. We became friends with them, but they were more my friends than Mia's. We were also not too far from her mom and grandma. That was convenient too. Mia saw her friends frequently, but full-time motherhood to three young children occupied a lot of all our time. I was very pleased to see how great a mother Mia was. When I think back to those early days with her fun-loving and partying lifestyle, I could come to no other conclusion than that she had definitely matured. Occasionally the craziness emerged, but not very often. Life was good for us in the city. It made no difference whatsoever for my business where I lived. The house we bought was good size, four bedrooms and three baths. It had an unfinished basement, and I framed it in an office for myself down there. Over the next year we settled into our home and our lifestyle in the city. I loved spending time with the kids and Mia, as I've said, was a wonderful mother. Socially we spent some time with her old St. Thomas crowd. 
We also hung out with Ryan and Teresa O'Malley, and occasionally with my old college friend Tim Pierce, Teresa's brother. In summary at this point, our relationship was great, our kids were doing well, and financially we were more than solid. We liked our house and our neighborhood, and we were fairly close to Mia's mom's house. What could go wrong? We had a sales meeting in Stanhope on this particular Friday, I hung around the office for a while and arrived back home around dinner time. When I got home it was the usual happy chaos of wrangling the kids into high chairs, bibs, etc. preparing for the onslaught of spilled beverages, dropped utensils, and food smeared across the kitchen counter. I've got something exciting to tell you. Mia smiled and told me. What? I asked. Later. She told me. Finally after all the kids were fed, bathed, pajamas on, tucked in and stories read. I walked back downstairs and saw Mia looking at her iPad in the dining room. So what's going on? I asked. Oh, Patrick, she began, I have this fantastic opportunity. I've talked to my mom and I think it will work. I stayed silent letting the conversation take its natural course. Eventually I knew all the important points would emerge. I was at the park with the kids and met Lisa there with her girls. She started. We stopped by her house and Mitch was home for lunch. He was in a bad mood. She went on to say that Mitch's job as head of sales and marketing at Langley Motors was stressful and overwhelming. He said that he needed a part-time marketing assistant. Someone to work 20 hours or so each week. At that point she stopped her story and looked at me, smiling. I was a bit confused at first. What does Mitch Markham's marketing assistant have to do with, and then I got it. You? I asked, and she nodded, still smiling. How in hell are you going to work 20 hours a week? I exclaimed. She then explained this elaborate plan with her mother coming here Tuesdays and Thursdays, and that Mitch said the time was flexible, and if necessary she could work from home. I didn't like this plan for several reasons. We didn't need the money, and if anything this was going to create more stress for me. I calmly protested. I tried to shoot some holes in her plan, but she had thought it through and had answers. I protested that we didn't need the money. Patrick, it's not about the money. I've got a college degree and I want to use it. I love the kids, but there are times I want to communicate with other adults. I really want this. She added. I mean, I still have to interview, she told me, but Mitch was already asking how soon I could start. I thought about it. My biggest concerns were about the children. They were still young and as I've said, me is a great mother. My secondary concern was, selfishly, me. It was hard enough compartmentalizing my job while working from home. Now with her working and my mother-in-law here with the kids most of the time, I was imagining increased interruptions. Eventually I gave in with the declaration, let's give it a try. As expected Mia got the job. The first few weeks were a bit of a challenge between understanding the automobile business and being separated from the children. Mia had been with them 24-7 for the most part their entire lives. We eventually settled into a rhythm. Her mom did a good job with the children on the days Mia worked, and any concerns I had about my work productivity vanished. Mia was in a better mood too, once she understood her role within the business better. She was happier and more confident. The break from childcare a few days a week was really having a more positive impact. At first it was every few weeks. I barely paid attention. But all of a sudden, I realized, her part-time job was resembling something closer to full-time. We began a discussion about this at one point, and it turned into an argument. Later she apologized and said she talked to Mitch about her hours. A few weeks later we were invited to a party at Blake Langley's house in Garlington Heights. Blake was there with an attractive younger woman I'd not met before. Mitch and Taylor and a few others were there with their wives. Blake, on his best hosting behavior, really poured on the charm to me. As I've said before he can really be fun to be around, and I was getting the full treatment. Mia is doing a very nice job in her marketing position. Business is up and I have to say that Mia's great work has helped. He told me. There were a total of about 20 people at the party. The weather was nice and we were all in the backyard around the pool. I nursed two light beers all evening, knowing I was going to drive the short distance home later. I was talking to a group of guys about Stanhope's upcoming football season and lost track of time. It had gotten dark out and amidst the conversation I looked up to check where Mia was. I scanned the backyard. I saw Lisa, Mia was normally near her. No Mia. Then, I thought, where's Langley? I glanced around. I didn't see him either. Was I overreacting? For my own peace of mind I decided to look around. Calmly but firmly I disengaged from the conversation about sports. I walked toward the sliding doors that led into the house. No one in the kitchen. I walked down the hall to the bathroom. It looked occupied. I went around the corner to the living room and saw the stairs heading to the second level. 
By this time I had gotten agitated. In my imagination I flashed back to that party years ago, and Langley and Mia coming down from upstairs. I was just about to mount the stairs, and I heard a voice from down the hall. It was Langley. Pat, he began, looking for the bathroom. He asked. I saw movement behind him in the dark hallway. I immediately walked toward him. What were they doing alone together in a dark part of the house? Abruptly I realized the person with him was Olivia, his young girlfriend. Suddenly I felt pretty stupid. Yes, I mustered up. I was looking for the bathroom, I lied. Langley looked at me oddly. I'd nearly made a fool of myself. He no doubt observed my odd behavior. He guided me to the upstairs bathroom, still the charming host. After I'd used the bathroom sheepishly I rejoined the party and saw Mia with Lisa, Mitch and a small cluster of people. All seemed normal. I kicked myself. Since we'd been married she'd never given me any reason to doubt her. That old memory of her and Langley kept replaying in my brain. Just let it go, I told myself. Later, driving the short distance home Mia was quiet. Typically she'd be upbeat and happy having spent time with her friends. She was different tonight. And another thing. When I went to make love to her she firmly demurred. Normally after a few drinks Mia seems to love sex. That's what I expected. That did not happen tonight. Two days later I received a message from Ryan O'Malley asking if I'd stop by one night this week. I'd become good friends with Ryan and Teresa. Mia less so. Occasionally we'd socialize with them, but far more likely it was just Ryan and I or even Ryan, Teresa and I hanging out together. Thursday evening I stopped by, after all the perfunctory handshakes and hugs we went out on their back deck. Teresa asked if I wanted a beer or something, and I told her no thanks. You may need one pat, Ryan declared seriously. Teresa came back with three beers. What's up? I asked. They paused, and there was an uncomfortable silence. I saw tears forming in Teresa's eyes. Got some bad news last week. Ryan began, cancer. Pancreatic cancer. A pretty bad kind. Ryan gave me the whole rundown. He had some pain, thought it would go away. It didn't. Finally he got in to see the doctor. Fairly quickly they did more tests and began working with an oncologist. Prognosis, maybe it year they're saying, his voice trembled with emotion when he said this. Here's the thing, he said to me, we don't want a whole bunch of people knowing. We're only telling family and a few close friends. I know you need to tell me, but I really don't want it to go past that. I sat there for a moment stunned, trying to digest this terrible news. What, I began, what can I do? I asked. Just be a good friend. Stop by when you can, Ryan said, and when, well afterwards, be a friend to Teresa, he looked over at her, tears streaming down her cheeks. Pat, you're one of the only true friends I trust. Teresa and I just wanted you to know. He told me. Later walking home I spilled my own tears thinking about what they had told me. I knew I needed to keep it together to support Ryan and Teresa. Life continued and I spent time with Ryan and Teresa when I could. A few times Mia came with me, but she seemed to find excuses to avoid these visits. She told me it was hard for her to think about death. When I told her it was hard for everyone she didn't answer. As I reflect back on this time in our lives, our relationship began to change. Very subtly at first but in retrospect we began veering off in different directions. I spent a lot of time with Ryan. Teresa sometimes too. A lot of my emotional energy was focused on my good friends. At the time I didn't realize it, but less energy was spent on my marriage. At the same time Mia began working more at her job with Langley Motors. Certainly we continued to function as a family, and with three small children including twins, there was always something to be done, so in many ways the shift between us wasn't noticed. In the beginning. As I've explained, I had a jealous streak. I know it seems a little off base, but the whole scene years ago at the party seeing Mia walk down those stairs with Langley with a fresh duck satisfied look on her face, continued to periodically flash through my thoughts. You may ask, why would you marry her if you don't completely trust her? And the answer is, if she hadn't been pregnant I doubt we would have ever gotten married. And I have to admit a few things. First off she is a great mom, and for most of our marriage a good wife. And, she had never given me any real reason to be suspicious. Finally, we'd always seemed to have had a solid emotional connection. Things began to shift. Again, with work, the kids, and supporting Ryan and Teresa, I was busy. Mia was working much more than the original 20 hours per week. With her mother and grandmother's help the household was mostly under control. But that emotional connection was being stretched. The first piece fell into place several weeks later. I'd stopped by to see Ryan. We had taken to playing chess together. He was much better than me, but it was an enjoyable pastime. Teresa got home an hour or so after I arrived. We chatted about normal things. 
I saw Mia downtown last night, she told me. Downtown? She arrived home after dinner last night, but I thought she had said she was working late. My curiosity spiked. Where did you see her? I asked calmly. Teresa said she was down near Clancy Street, an area of restaurants, bars, and boutique retail. Oh really, I replied, still calm, who was she with? Teresa looked at me sharply. Ryan with a pawn lifted, froze mid-move, and studied me too. Ah, Teresa stuttered, I couldn't tell. She paused, I was driving up Clancy and I saw her. She's so beautiful she's hard to miss. Everything okay Pat? Ryan asked. I tried to assure them all was fine, but I think they saw through my outward behavior. A little later I left, walking the short distance home. On the walk I tried to formulate a way to ask about her down on Clancy Street during the time the children were being fed. She mentioned nothing about going out somewhere. That evening after all the kids were down I asked her what she was working on at work. She told me they were planning a big sales event, and that was why she'd been working late. I asked her if she had to meet media representatives from the local radio and TV stations. She explained no, that was all done online. I don't get out of my cubicle much, she told me. Who approves the ad campaign? I asked. Well first Mitch and then eventually Ryan, she answered, but then looked at me, what's with all the questions all of a sudden? She asked. I said I was just curious. She studied me not buying my newfound curiosity. She got quiet all of a sudden and went up to bed. I sat there in the kitchen, thinking. It wasn't a difficult conclusion. I knew for sure my wife had just lied to me. I just wasn't sure why. For the next week or so she was home early, was involved with the kids, and seemed to try to connect better with me. If not for my suspicions this would be a happy time for the family. The following week she worked late Monday getting home after the kids were in bed. And then two days later I got a text message from her. Need to work late mom's okay with helping with kiddos dinner. As the kids were finishing up eating, I told my mother-in-law I needed to run a quick errand. She was happy to stay with the kids. As I drove by the auto dealership I looked for her black Highlander. I knew the employees parked on the north side of the building. You could see the parking lot from the frontage road. As I drove past I noted no cars in the parking lot. I knew Langley drove a Lexus SUV. No Lexus and certainly no black Highlander. I checked my watch, 7.36pm. I turned around and drove home hoping and praying Mia was there, and our paths just hadn't crossed. Unfortunately she wasn't. She arrived a quarter to nine. Her late nights were getting later. The kids were already down for the night. She'd missed that. Where were you? I asked. Where do you think I was? She answered, an edge to her voice. Were you at work? I began, in your office. Of course I was, where else would I be? Her attitude getting more negative. I sat on the couch digesting line number two. I barely noticed when she walked away. I sat there for nearly an hour contemplating what to do. All signs pointed to her doing something she didn't want me to know about. Most likely with Langley. The following day Mia was home at a regular time. She was happy and in a good mood. This had become a rare occurrence, and despite my suspicions it led to a pleasant evening, kind of like the good old days. A fun dinner with the kids and then bathing, pajamaing, teeth brushing and reading. Their bedtime ritual. It was always more pleasant when both of us were involved. Later, once I came down from the bedrooms, I found Mia in the living room with a glass of white wine. She was still in a good mood. We were invited up to Blake's family cabin on Baltus Lake this Saturday. The kids too. She told me. I didn't reply, digesting the information. Mitch and Lisa, Taylor and some of the others will all be there she added. The weather's supposed to be nice. It will be fun. I paused before answering. I didn't really want to go with this crowd, but I really wanted to know what was going on with Mia and Langley. Or not. I agreed to go, and I told her I thought it would be fun. The following evening, Thursday, I walked over to Ryan and Teresa's. As I've mentioned they lived around the corner a block and a half away. I hated to see it, but there was no doubt Ryan was becoming visibly worse. He looked gaunt, and his skin had an unnatural color. He spent some time reviewing the latest medical information that they had received. Unfortunately there was nothing that could be construed as positive. Still both Ryan and Teresa maintained a good attitude, and I admired them for that. What's going on with you? Ryan asked me. Everything okay? He looked at me with a concerned expression. I felt bad, here my friend had a terminal disease and my own personal problems were putting me in a bad mood. It's nothing, I told them, trying to summon up a more positive attitude. Hey buddy, we're your friends. What's going on? I sat there for a moment, and then I told them of my suspicions about Mia and Langley. I wondered about that after seeing her downtown a few weeks ago. 
I didn't see Blake there, but I just got a vibe that she was on some kind of date, Teresa said. I then told them that she lied to me about that night. I told them about the odd hours. And finally I admitted I had no proof, but it felt like things were slipping in our marriage. As I was leaving they pledged their friendship and offered any help that I may need. Keep your eyes and ears open up at the lake this weekend, Ryan suggested. That Saturday was beautiful and we left before 9am. It was about an hour away by car. A few of the people were staying overnight, but that was fortunately impossible for us with three children. The house was an old log lodge that had been modernized and added onto. There was a dock, a boat, and jet skis. There was a small sandy beach on one part of the lake that was perfect for the children to play in. Mia and a couple of the other mothers sat up down on this small beach. The kids waited and splashed in the shallow water. The woman chatted and I moved away. I wandered the grounds and talked to some of the others and grabbed a beer. I noticed Langley, Mitch, Taylor and a couple of others all clicked together. Occasionally I heard Langley's loud booming voice. I did see the beautiful Olivia, Langley's girlfriend, mingling. That made me feel somewhat better. After a bit Mia asked if I'd watch the kids for a while, and I agreed. I saw her, the now pregnant Lisa, and their friends chatting up near the house. I was focused on the kids, making sure they didn't get too deep in the water. Occasionally a jet ski would swing past us. The kids were fascinated by the shiny water vehicles and the loud noises they made. It must have been a half hour later that I looked up and saw Mia's group all clustered together. I saw Lisa and a few of the others, but I did not see Mia. But when I focused on the kids in the water, I intermittently scanned the grounds to try and find her. I didn't see her. I was on the verge of hauling the kids up to dry land so I could look a little more intently, when I heard Langley. I peered around one of the big evergreens, and I saw him, with his arm around his girlfriend Olivia on the far side near the dock in a cluster of people. Maybe there truly was no reason to worry. I hoped. A little later Mia appeared. I can take over now, she breathed to me. She looked almost normal. Something was off and I studied her trying to figure out what was different. What? She began, why are you staring at me? I'll watch the kids now, go have fun. I wanted to clear my head a little, so I decided to take a walk along the west side of the lake. I'd noticed some trails heading that direction when we first arrived. I walked through the forest and came upon a fork in the trail. I took the inland fork and continued along the narrow trail pondering my life. I took stock. I had a good job that paid well, and I was good at it. I love my kids, and despite my recent reservations, I love Mia too. Mia was a great mother and we lived in a nice neighborhood. There could have been some perfectly good reasons for the discrepancies, I guess you could call them, in her whereabouts those few times. Buoyed by my optimistic thoughts I decided to head back to the party. I was walking that inland trail back and all of a sudden I heard people talking. It sounded like they were on the other branch of the trail. The one closer to the lake. I paused parallel to whoever it was talking, screened by a thicket of hardwood trees. Without doubt I heard Langley's loud voice, and I knew it was likely he was with his buddies. And that's why we close early on Wednesdays, I heard Langley laugh and say, to get some of that spread eagle on the desk. Muffled noises obscured some of the comments. To see her, with that body naked on the desk. More unintelligible comments, and laughter. I look forward to it all day long every Wednesday, I can't wait to lock up. At that moment a couple of jet skis blasted up the lake, and for several moments I couldn't hear anything that was said. There was a short garbled conversation, and then I heard someone else say. As the lawyer for the firm I need to remind you about the anti-fraternization policy, I heard Taylor say seriously to Langley, I assumed. Just then another jet ski flew by obscuring some of what was said. But through the noise there was a phrase I thought I heard from the muffled talk. And furthermore Pat's a good guy, so more noise from the lake, but I made out one last phrase, his wife. At that point all three of the jet skis roared past. I heard nothing else that I could make out through the racket. It also sounded like the guys were heading back, their voices grew quieter as I sat hunched behind the clump of trees. I sat there processing. Even though I couldn't hear everything that was said, it was fairly obvious what was going on. Langley was ducking me at least every Wednesday night. Sounded like on his desk after the dealership closed early. And then he bragged about it to his buddies. Taylor, the company lawyer, was warning Langley about potential consequences. And apparently he had a sliver of sympathy toward me. The upbeat mood I'd mustered up just a few minutes ago deflated like a pop balloon. That's it for part 1, friends. Stay tuned for part 2 tomorrow. Make sure to subscribe and tap that notification bell so you don't miss the exciting conclusion to our story.